So dear respected brothers and our dear friends and listeners, wherever you are, Alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us an opportunity to have another Ramadan, which we've just finished, Alhamdulillah, we're just out of Ramadan in the month of Shawwal. And there's a few changes that have taken place, like the shaitan is back out. We had enjoyed a month without the shaitan. And mashallah, with increased religiosity and piety, uh, the doors of paradise were opened, the doors of hellfire was closed. And we just overall felt better. Socially, people uh, were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, doing extra prayers, etc. So we all felt like doing that as Alhamdulillah. What a wonderful environment that was. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it and grant us its full reward. And the main thing is, the main thing is that we thank Allah that He gave us the ability to have this additional Ramadan. May Allah allow us to have many more Ramadans. <coughs> there's a hadith uh, in which it mentions that there's two friends, two associates that died. <laughs> One of them died earlier, one of them died later. The one who died earlier had more deeds. He was he used to do a lot of effort, he had a lot more deeds. He died first. Then the other one died, and he they find that the one who died later, who used to strive less, he used to do his basics, you know, he used to do his stuff, but the first one used to do much more. The second one was actually found to be uh, in paradise closer. Why? He said because he got another Ramadan. Ramadan is a massive boost. Ramadan gives a thousand months of extra worship. So Alhamdulillah. Because people in the earlier times, Adam Alayhi Salaam, Nuh Alayhi Salaam, they used to live for like a thousand years. In the time of Adam Alayhi Salaam, somebody died who around the age of 200 and something. They said, poor guy died very young. Right? He was over 200 years old. So Allah has compensated for us in our, mashallah, tradition in Islam that He gives us these Laylatul Qadrs. Okay. So Ramadan is gone now. So I'm not encouraging, I mean, it's done. Whatever's done is done. May Allah accept it now. We hope for the next Ramadan. But what I want to just think about is something very important. When you read the life stories of the earlier, of our earlier generations, of our earlier scholars and awliya, there is something really interesting that they say about them, which is, they say that when Ramadan was finished, the next six months they would spend in just asking Allah for acceptance. Because, mashallah, the thousand months, if it's not accepted, then what's the point? Yeah. So they would, they would be concerned that is it accepted or not. Then, then once those six months approximately are over and then they're worried about the next Ramadan, so they would actually start preparing for the next Ramadan six months in advance. Now, I don't know if any of us feel that way. Anybody do that six months, six months? I don't. So, the question is that, okay, we don't feel like that. Now, let's look at the purpose of Ramadan. The purpose of Ramadan was to gain taqwa. Assalamu alaikum. The purpose of Ramadan, Assalamu alaikum little boy. Inshallah. The first, uh, the purpose of Ramadan is to gain taqwa. The purpose of Ramadan is to take benefit from whatever is offered in Ramadan. 
Okay? What does that exactly mean? If you have sales on, where they're selling things for very cheap, like cars and clothing and so on, it's a sales period. You don't go in a sales period to buy only those things or primarily to buy those things that are going to only benefit you for those days, like a restaurant maybe, where you just eat and finish. Oh, it's on offer, let me go now. In sales, what you want to do is you want to buy for later. So you buy clothing or a car or something else, gadgets, appliances that are going to now benefit you forever. They're going to benefit you for the next so many months or years. You want to pick it up at a good cost now. You want to get a special on now so that you can benefit from it later. I see Ramadan like this. I don't see it as there's a restaurant that is giving an offer, 50% off. It's a really nice restaurant. Let me just go and eat and I'm not going to eat there again. So I won't benefit again. That's not what I see it as. The purpose of Ramadan is not that, oh, just work extra for one month and then finish. Go back to normal. So, in other words, let's just imagine that we give a score to ourselves for our Iman. We entered Ramadan with 5 out of 10 in Iman level. For example, 5 out of 10 Imani level. When we entered Ramadan, mashallah, through the month of Ramadan, we got to what? 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Did anybody get to a 10 out of 10? Anybody? 10 out of 10? Uh, 9 out of 10, inshallah? Yeah, mashallah, I see some heads. Uh, six, seven out of ten at least, inshallah, right? It was definitely better than before Ramadan, right? So does that mean now when Ramadan is finished, we go back to a five? So it was only for Ramadan. After Ramadan, we go back to normal. Ramzan ke baad dekhenge. Ramzan ke baad karenge. Abhi nahi kar sakte. Sorry, I'm talking Urdu. Um, just in case you're wondering what language that is. So... Ramadan is not supposed to be like this inconvenience, this change of schedule, I have to do this, sab karte hai, I must do it as well. Oh, when Ramadan finishes, I can go back to doing exactly the same thing. Unless, so Ramadan is supposed to be a booster. So if we've got to a six, seven, eight, nine, ten, we don't want to go back to a five after Ramadan. If we drop, we probably will because shaitan is back out and the environment is not there. You don't, still don't want to go to five. You want to stay somewhere. Okay, let's take another example. If you eat from a restaurant, you really enjoyed it and you over-ordered, don't you get a bit tired at the end of the food that, hey man, I don't want to touch this food again. But with a restaurant, you can easily go back, right? Imagine somebody invited you to their house and their wife is an amazing cook. May Allah bless her, whoever she is. And you had an amazing dish and you're smacking your lips and you just remember that. But you can't go back and say, give me some more of that. It's not a restaurant, is it? You can't just impose yourself. So for weeks on end, you're just relishing. Wow, what a dish that is. You know, Essie Biryani Banaiti or whatever it was. Like, wow, I've never tasted anything like that. You're going to relish it. You're going to relish it. Imagine you had a quick meeting with somebody who you really respect. And it was a short meeting, you would have loved to have long, but you can't. He's busy or you can't. Somebody you love or somebody you really have a lot of respect for. You're going to reminisce, you're going to re remember that meeting and think over it over and over again. Imagine you manage to go and see something. Whether that be someone or something beautiful. A beautiful spectacle, a beautiful image, imagery a place, a scenery, and you can't go, you just, wow, that was amazing. That was amazing. You keep thinking about it. So does, do we think like that about Ramadan? <clears throat> we either do or we don't. I mean, there's, there's no two ways about it, right? And I'm not trying to make us feel guilty here. But if you don't feel like it, you're condemned or something like that. I'm not trying to make us feel guilty. I'm just trying to say that we definitely need to change our perspective we need to upgrade ourselves to understand what really Ramadan is and maybe in the future we'll start feeling like that. If we don't feel about it like that for the Ramadan that's just passed, okay, khalas. May Allah still accept. But next Ramadan, I want to be better than this Ramadan. After Ramadan, I want to relish it. I want to prepare for it. And my Ramadan needs to benefit me for the next 11 months. So I'll give you an example. There was a, brother, there was a guy who said that he was involved in this particular sin. 
just couldn't get out of it. It was an addiction. Year after year, he tried to stop. He would stop for a short while and, and res try to resist it. And then after a few weeks, it, uh, he would go and do it again and so on and so forth. That one Ramadan, he said, I'm just showing you the power of Ramadan. That one Ramadan, he said that I made a lot of effort, a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Ramadan finished. And then he said, Ajeeb, strange that I did not even think about the sin anymore. Like I had immunity, like I wouldn't even think about it. Before I would think about it and try to resist it. Now it's not even open in my mind. It's not even a, a desire. One, two, three, four, five months. He said seven months it went like that. Then after about seven months, I started getting weak. I started feeling like I need to do it. You know. Then I don't know what happened. Then he tells me, uh, then he says that a year or two later, he again said in Ramadan, this time I want to last the whole year. He made a lot of effort. He sat in Etikaf that year. Mm -hmm. And then he, had, he went to Hajj that year as well, two and a half months later. He said, this year, Alhamdulillah, the immunity, the resistance lasted for about nine months. Okay. I didn't even feel like it. What do you mean by feel like it? You know, who likes shopping here? Like genuine question. Who likes going nice supermarket, checking out this one, right? I mean, you enjoy shopping. You do as well, all right? There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. As long as you don't overspend, there's nothing wrong with that, right? You know when you go around, you want to check every aisle out. You go to Costco or whatever, you want to check every aisle out, see what's new on offer. You go there once every seven weeks, six weeks, you know, because if you go to Costco too often, you spend too much money. All right. You have a Costco here? It's a big fear now, yeah. So, there's two or three aisles that you can miss. Which aisles can you miss where you don't have to bother looking at them? The wine. The wine. Alhamdulillah. You can just go past it. I don't even feel like it. Alhamdulillah, Allah saved us from it. I don't have to worry about it or anything like that. But a person who likes wine is like, I need to check it out, man. What's the newest wine? You, you understand? The switch is off. Immunity we have. It switches off. May Allah switch all the sins off from our minds. <coughs> Because then life would be easy. And may Allah switch many, many switches off from our mind for the sins, then it'd be easy. Because then the reason we want to do a sin is because the switch is on, man, it looks good. He said, This year, mashallah, for nine months, I had immunity. I didn't catch a flu. I didn't get allergies. I just didn't feel like it. Then at the end of, I mean, he didn't like the sin of it. After about nine months, he said, I started feeling loose again. Uh, inclined but he said this time I said no I've got two months left 10 and 11 months the 12th month is Ramadan I want to pull it to Ramadan and get back into the safe space and he said I managed to drag myself through this without doing the sin this was my first year in many 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 years that I did not commit the sin for the whole year that's the power of Ramadan that's what we want it for so now as I said I'm not trying to make us feel bad but what I want to say now, in the second half of this talk, is how do we get better, feel better, want to get better, because we're never going to be perfect. We're always going to be trying until we die. But our job is to just try better each year and enhance ourselves. So inshallah, next Ramadan is going to be better than this Ramadan. But how is it going to be better than next Ramadan? How is our next Ramadan going to be better than this Ramadan? And how the, are the benefits going to continue for the months? How is after Ramadan going to be better than this after Ramadan? And how can we do that now? So I think for this, we have to take an assessment of why we have an issue. I think the reason why we have an issue is because what we consider important in life, what we consider to be important in life, we obviously pursue what's important in our life. That's what most people do. Some people are losers, they just get along, they just basically survive, right? However it is, enjoy themselves in the best way they can and they just go through. But the serious ones, majority of people are serious and successful. We make an effort behind what we think is important. And mostly what we think is important is the life of this world, earning a living, making a good home for ourselves and our future generations and so on, which is nothing wrong with. But we can't exclusively be focused on that. 
we have to be focused on our real home, which is the hereafter, <coughs> which is going to be forever. How do we get focused on that? People will tell you, the khutbas will tell you, the bayans will tell you, brother, you must think about the akhirah. You must send rewards for the akhirah. Why don't we? We do a bit, but why don't we do more? Why isn't that a big focus? Why isn't that as important as the paycheck at the end of the month? Or is it as important? Why isn't it as important as decorating our house of this world? When you buy a house, you want to decorate it. You want a house and then you want to decorate it. We're supposed to make a house for the hereafter because we're going to live there for sure. But why aren't we worried about buying that house, expanding the house, because that one is you're going to get forever. So we want to make it the best possible. Here you can actually just do step ups where you get one and then you get another one and so on. But there, that's it. That's going to be the house. And then a decoration of it. Has anybody ever considered a decoration of their hereafter house? But we have of this world. We, we think about how to decorate. I remember I got a house and uh, a friend of mine who's a religious person as well. And he said, look, uh, I said, it's so confusing what paint and there's, I just want white. And uh, in white paints, there's 20 different types of white paints. Do you know that? There's 20 shades of whites. It's crazy. It's right. Especially if you're like a particular person, it's even crazier for you. He said, no, no, you can't just do it white, you need a feature wall. I said, I have no time for a feature wall. He says, you can have special paint on that one, you can have special wallpaper on there, and design. I was like, look, I don't have time for that, I just want it function. I know what, I'm going to put my kitabs there. That would be my feature <coughs> wall. So, this is what everybody's out doing one another in the decoration of their home. You got the money. If you've got the money, you, you then you get cars. Uh, once you've got more money after cars, then what do you compete with? It's a license plates, personalized license plates. There's always something to do. And I'm not saying anything, any of this is haram, you do it for the right reason. It, I'm just saying that what about this world of the hereafter? So the question today is genuine. Like We always be reminded of this, but why don't we think about it? So I think I've come to a conclusion, the reason is because of ignorance and thus inattentiveness. If you know what Allah has in store and we are being reminded of it often enough and we are learning more and more and we're developing love for Allah. So I think it's ignorance of who Allah really is for us, what He really wants from us and what He wants to give us. It's an ignorance of all of that. I'll tell you why. If I ask all of you that the Islam you know, except the converts, the converts have a different story, mashallah, right? If, uh, if, if you've been born a Muslim, the Islam that you know, majority of the stuff in Islam that you know, where did you learn it? Parents. From your parents or from your teacher of childhood? So your maktab, madrasa, childhood teacher or your parents, right? That's the majority that you learned. <coughs> Do your parents keep teaching you afterwards? Some do, but not like officially, not formally, right? They just tell you off sometimes. Anything after that, we still have developed more knowledge after that, but that's like random khutbas, bayans that you'll, you'll go to the bus. You never know what they're going to speak about in Juma bayan, do you? Or do you? You didn't know what I was going to speak about today. I may have not known, right? So it's just whatever comes, alhamdulillah. But whatever we learned we, when we were young and growing up, was just to keep, give, us, give us a basis, a foundation, a fundamental uh, operating uh, platform, there's a lot more to learn. That's just basics. There's a lot more to learn. And you can't carry on your life successful with the basics in any field. The basics just get you going, then you need to upgrade yourself, upgrade your knowledge, then you become more cutting edge, you become more advanced. In our Sharia, we're not advanced. Can we reach that conclusion that we're not necessarily advanced? When we're not, we don't know. We don't even know Allah properly, to be honest. We don't know Allah properly. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you an example. Why does Allah want worship from us? Why do we do good deeds? By the way, why do you do a good deed? If you're, gonna, if you're going to donate in the path of Allah, tell me why do you, what's your motivation in donating? Give me, give me a few reasons if you want, go on, quickly. Do you want paradise? <coughs> to please Allah. To get closer to Allah. So, mashallah, some of this is good. 
it's fine to say, I want paradise. I want to stay, I'm praying my Jumu'ah because, why, why do you pray Jumu'ah? I want to stay away from hellfire would be one good reason. I want paradise. These are basic reasons. Nothing wrong with them. They are basic reasons. They're good reasons. However, the higher reason is that I just want Allah to be pleased with me. And I'm a slave. That's what I should be doing. I just want to fulfill my role in this world. Another point. The more, you understand, the more we understand is the more you'll see your Islam will become refined. For example, if I did a job, like if I did tahajjud, for example, if Allah gave me the tawfiq, I'd be like, oh, mashallah, alhamdulillah, right? And it might even make me feel like I'm better than so-and-so. Like if you manage to do tahajjud and somebody else doesn't even pray, you're going to think like, man, what's wrong with that guy? I'm doing my five daily prayers plus tahajjud. That riya, that uh, ostentation showing off can come in your mind. I once finally read from Ibn Ata'illah al-Iskandari, he says that, you should consider it sufficient. Listen carefully. You should consider it sufficient as a reward. It is sufficient as a reward for the act that you have just done, that Allah found you worthy of it. Think about that carefully. Allah found you worthy of this act. That's a reward on its own. That is the reward of it. Why are you worried about any reward after that? Aapko apni jaza mil gayi ki Allah taala na aapko ahl samja is ibadat ka. Aap sawab ko talash kar rahe thi ki aap kar sakte hain. Lekin Allah taala na aapko iska ahl samja ki aapko tahajjud padne di. That is a reward, a bigger reward than anything. Because so many people don't pray tahajjud, for example, or prayers. Now, when you start thinking about it like that, can you see how you become humbled? And there's no showing off in that. Alhamdulillah, thanks to Allah. Thanks to Allah. Your whole paradigm shifts. The purpose, the purpose is to think <coughs> that I am an abd and a slave of Allah and Allah has given me this opportunity. I have to earn a living. Halal, inshallah, Allah give us halal. Stay away from haram. And I need to make my real home. But the only way I'm going to do that is this. I've got five minutes to talk about this. Seven minutes. Four things. How can we know Allah better? You see, you cannot get close to Allah or anyone without knowing them. Without knowing about them so the love increases. If I, I, there's sometimes some brother in the masjid, I've seen him for five years, but I never talked to him, he's very quiet. One day, I just bumped into him outside or something and just started talking to him and I found out, wow, you know, he does X, Y, and Z and, you know, really nice brother. Suddenly, my love for him has increased. Before, I was like, I didn't even know much about him. Yeah, it's happened sometimes. Why? You can only love someone and get closer and the more you know, as long as they don't have bad qualities. If they have bad qualities, then you'll get repulsed. Right? Nafrat. If they have good qualities, then you'll just feel closer to them. Have you read reviews of Allah? Have you ever read a review of Allah to understand who He is? Are we seeking Allah? Sorry to use a products example. We can't get closer to Allah or do things for His sake and understand what He wants from us without knowing Him. Okay, how do we get to know Allah then? Look, before we die, Allah has given His words to us. He's spoken to us. We read those words, many of us who are not Arabs, and even some Arabs, we read them without understanding. And that's, alhamdulillah, even that is good. Allah has given us tawfiq to do that. Please, at least once in our life, try to understand what Allah is telling us. Just read once what He has told us. It'll take a few years, get a tarjuma, a good translation, and along with your normal reading, <coughs> Just read a few pages a day. What is Allah saying to me? Because He's talking to me and you and everyone. At least before we die, we've heard Allah. We've heard His communication. And believe me, that would increase your iman. It, it can't fail. Because that's Allah's words. They're very powerful. Yes, you won't understand everything because there are some confusing parts. But you'll understand most of it. You'll understand the message. And above all, you will understand Allah. Subhanallah. How he deals with people, what he wants, his kindness, his generosity, his compassion, his benevolence. You'll see his actions in act, his attributes in action. 
you will see him basically doing what he does by telling us what he wants, by telling us what he's done to others, what he promised others, how he's punished others, how he's warned some people, and so on and so forth. You can't get that just like that. Read the Quran. And of course, if you can go beyond tarjuma and listen to a good tafsir or read a good tafsir, that's even better. But I'm saying, at least before you die, don't you have a desire to know what your God is saying to you? Or we have no time? We're never going to have time. The world is only getting busier. <laughs> they, keep, they, they, they keep delaying the retirement age. <laughs> so when are you going to retire? SubhanAllah. Okay, that's number one. Number two, we have a Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And again, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but I'm just saying this in a different way. Don't you want to know what your Prophet says to us? What he has said to us on multiple subjects? Have you ever read 40 hadith? Five hadith? Yes, you may have been exposed to random hadith. When I say random, I mean you didn't intend it was from the bayan or something like that. You got a forward, you don't even know it's a correct hadith, a knocker, and all these forwards you get. But have you ever intentionally said, you know what, I want to see what the Prophet has said about this? Tell me what the Prophet has said this. Let me look at five hadith about this. Let me, because everything that the Prophet said or did is recorded, pretty much. I want to know what the Prophet did in this situation. We don't even want to read 40 hadith in our life. Like intentionally, not just because we have to in a bayan. And number three, the Prophet's life story, Sirah. Don't we want to at least read it once? Yes, we've heard many anecdotes and incidents from the Prophet Sallallahu life, over the course of our life we've heard. But how many of us have listened to a full seerah or read a full seerah? You know, so at least that some people have done that, but majority of people would not have done that. Like, they, they don't know the full life story of Prophet Sallallahu they just know anecdotes. And if you're a thinking person who likes debating, discussing, then you're just going by the little bits you know and there's a lot of gaps in your knowledge. And you know what the most amazing thing is? But the most amazing thing is, I can give you many examples of this. The day you start looking into this for yourself, you'll get hooked. It won't be boring. Initially, it might be boring because you're forcing yourself away from all of our other distractions. But once you see the benefit, because you'll be more confident, you'll have solid knowledge, not just hearsay from our cultural aspects. You'll be hearing it from Allah. You'll be hearing His, His words and the Prophet's words. And you'll be a lot more confident and a lot more comforted that I'm getting a fulfillment because their words are full of comfort. And you'll become lovers of Allah and His Messenger. When you become a lover of Allah, you become lover of the Akhirah. That, that's what you need. That's why we don't feel after Ramadan, we go back to normal. Because we don't have this love, I think. And it, you can't have this love with ignorance. Can you see? Why don't you have the? Why don't we feel good? Uh, why don't we feel continuation of Ramadan? Because we don't have the love of Allah and His Messenger in the way we should. Why don't we have that? Because we have ignorance. Why do we have ignorance? Let's ask that question. Is because we don't have any time. But that's what we think. Because in London you don't have any time. I've travelled up north. There's a lot of people, mashallah, because rents are cheaper, so people don't have to struggle. I mean, here all of our adult children, you know, they they're either required or they have to work or they feel like they must work. Boys and girls, everybody, right? Am I giving you an excuse because you live in London? No, I'm just saying that that's what we think. Yes, it is a bit more expensive, but believe me, we're going to be really, really regretting it if we don't focus. <coughs> we're really going to be regretting it because this knowledge is necessary for us. This connection with Allah and His Messenger is knowledge for us. Then our life is so... You know, we started a class. We started a class for sisters. The masjid was empty in the morning, so we said, let's do a two-year class for sisters that usually stay at home, they're not working in the mornings. So we started it. We got about, I don't know, 15, 20 students from the age of 17 to 70. The course, well, they were doing nothing like, okay, let's do it. But they were the only the ones Allah chose. There were a lot of others, obviously. Two years, yes, we had a few dropouts, but the core group of whatever number it was, after two years, they didn't want to leave. Can you give us another year? So we give them another syllabus. Another year, another year. They were hooked. 
Mm -hmm. like we have benefited so much personally in our lives, in our marriage, in our children, everything. We know, we're learning about Islam. Seven years and only the reason we have to shut the class down is because we don't have space, I think. We have to have other classes. They stayed for seven years. This was in Stamford Hill. Seven years. You get hooked to this stuff, believe me. And you've got your whole life to become, a, become an alim. You've got your whole life. Take short, short classes. Go and learn something. Go and read. Keep reading. Stop giving fatwas though. You don't want to start becoming your own self-made muftis, right? You don't cause problems. It's to benefit ourselves. Okay? So, uh, I, I think I've made, a, made my point, inshallah, and our time is up. I mean, if it does help, we have a platform where you can do this, which is called Rayyan Institute. It just came to my mind right now. This is not what I did this, but I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Rayyan courses, Rayyan Institute, it's literally for general people to take courses on demand at whatever time you want. Mm -hmm. It's a subscription fee monthly, and then you just get the courses that I would specifically recommend the Islamic Essential Certificate course, which is 20 short modules, a bit about hadith, a bit about tafsir, a bit about fiqh, a bit about aqidah, a bit about Islamic history, a bit about uh, seerah. You'll get a bit of everything, then you can decide what else you want to do after that. It'll just get you started off. You'll get hooked, inshallah, and your life will become enriched. Your work and everything ethic will become better, and we will become lovers of Allah. May Allah accept us for His love. May Allah allow us to follow the sunnah of the Prophet.